No, people tell me I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to give it to a, a, a property manager. All right. How are you going to pick your property manager? How are you going to know if your property manager is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing if you've never done it? I'm not telling you not to give your stuff to a property manager, but learn how to do it first. No, so that you know what, exactly. so you can manage your property manager too. So that is exactly what Kevin and I, we did a episode all about how to find a property manager and the questions that you should use to ask and to vet them, right? Because just because Joe down the street knows how to prop property manage doesn't mean that's going to be your guy. Everybody has different levels as to what's important to them. So you need to make sure that your property manager is going to be taking care of what is important to you. Welcome to your Landlord Resource Podcast. Many moons ago, when I started as a landlord, I was as green as it gets. I may have had my real estate license, but I lacked confidence and the hands-on experience needed when it came to dealing with tenants, leases, maintenance, and bookkeeping. After many failed attempts, fast forward to today, Kevin and I have doubled our doors and created an organized, professionally operated rental property business. Want to go from overwhelmed to confident? If you're an ambitious landlord or maybe one in the making, join us as we provide strategies and teach actionable steps to help you reach your goals and the lifestyle you desire, all while building a streamlined and profitable rental property business. This is your Landlord Resource Podcast. Hello there, landlords, and welcome to the Your Landlord Resource Podcast. I am your host, Stacey Casella, and where normally I have my better half, Kevin Kilroy, on here with me, today I'm flying solo. Don't worry, he's here. He's just in the background handling all the production of today's episode. Because Today, we are so excited to be interviewing our friend, Dan Borrero of USA Land Ventures. Dan is a self-managing landlord of over 100 doors out in New Jersey. I believe he actually lives in New York, maybe, but owns rentals and land in New York, New Jersey, and Florida. He and his pretty sizable team have been handling the management of his rentals since 1989. And he is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to dealing with everything there is to know about owning and operating a rental property business. This man has ridden the ups and downs and is still going strong. And not only is he smart as hell, but he's also one of the kindest guys you'll ever meet. I mean, he just gets it. And by it, I mean life. He is understanding and has compassion for everyone especially those who have or want to start their own rental property business. So without further ado, let's bring on Dan Barrero. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. No, thank you for the invitation. No, of course. So we have been following you on your Instagram account for several years now, and we really enjoy all the videos that you're putting out there. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. So today. I think we want to focus on what it takes to be a rental property owner or like a, an entrepreneur, if you will. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? Yeah. So I actually, I always knew I wanted to be a real estate investor. I just didn't know what that meant since I was a kid. I remember, you know, growing up, I remember every month, summer months I would be home and every month a man would come to the door, knock on the door, my mother would give him an envelope. And then I always... But you know, the, the night before my parents would be like stuffing the envelope with whatever the cash was amount, whatever the rent was. Right. And, and he would just come to the door and get the cash and he'd have a pre-written receipt and give it to my mother and walk away. And then he'd go up to every single apartment. And I remember one time I actually was following him and my mother's like, what are you doing? I says, I, I just want to see what he does. And he says, she's like, he does nothing but knock on doors and collect the rent, right? You know? So I remember saying to myself as a kid, I says, I want to do that. Yeah. I want to collect rent. Yeah, I just want to just knock on people's doors and get money. Of course, it's not that simple, but yeah. that was my first exposure that I remember uh, being exposed to that. So I just always wanted to be wealthy. I know that sounds crazy. I saw a cousin of mine that I haven't seen in about 20 years. This happened last month. And she says, you know, I got to ask you a question. Are you rich yet? And I says, why do you ask me that? And she said, because as a kid, that's all you ever spoke about, that you were going to be wealthy. Oh, and I said, you know what? It all depends on who you ask. 
because yeah. everyone's got a different definition for what rich is, right? Right. Uh, but the point is, that's literally when I started my journey of deciding I wanted to be wealthy. Mm -hmm. After I graduated from college, I had a government job. I knew I wanted to open up my own business. I worked all the overtime I possibly could. I literally then opened up, you may think this is crazy, a video store in 1985. And everybody at the job was like, are you nuts? You're leaving this job to go open a video store? And I was like, well, I got two years to come back. Yeah. Yeah. That was 1985. I struggled for the first three years. The only, my only helper worker was my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And she would come and help me after she got out of work. And then the business just exploded where nice. it was just generating so much cash. So from that cash is where I literally got my first down payment. And it was funny because, you know, people would ask me like, are you ever going to get a new car? And I was like, well, what's wrong with the one that I have, right? Yeah. You know, we yeah. live below our means and I bought my first property and I want everyone to understand. I didn't know anything that I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I was walking up the corner to the hardware store, left my video store and needed a doorknob. I went to the hardware store and I see a sign about a half a block up on this building that was right across the street from my girlfriend's mother's house. Okay. Who's now my wife. And I literally said, wow, this, this would be, I would love to buy this building. It was a two family pre-war construction brick building. Now, back then this particular neighborhood was not what it is today. Mm -hmm. Banded houses to the right, abandoned houses to the left, empty blocks across the street because the city had knocked them down because they had become crack dens. Um, um yeah. so I literally walked back down the corner, got a paper and pen. Wrote down the number, walked back down the corner, called the realtor. And realtor says, you could get in. I could have sold it a dozen times, but the tenants won't let me in. It was oh. a foreclosure by Greenpoint Savings Bank, quote unquote. And I'll even tell you his name. His name was Steven Sirota. And I said, well, can I get in? And what happens? He says, you're not going to get in. I says, all right, I'll try to get in. So I went and knocked. On, I just literally went and knocked on the door. And the person that opened the door, I knew. From when I was a kid, I used to play basketball with him in the schoolyard. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. So I explained to him what I was there for. And he was like, yeah, come on in. And then I realized he had taken this apartment. It's a two, it was a two-story apartment. And he had made rooms into, out of them. And he had something like 12 rooms. He was in getting like $50 a week at the time. Oh, okay. So, yeah. All was... illegal, right? You know, nothing legal. So I said to him, I want to buy this building, but I can't have you here like this. He says, no, I'll leave. The bank said they'll give me money to leave. I said, okay. they will. And he said, yeah, he gave me, I told me what it was. I don't remember what it was. And I said, well, how do I get in downstairs? He goes, oh, you know, those people too. I said, I do. And he says, and he said the name of the person. I says, oh yeah, I know them. And I knocked on their door and they let me in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I then walked back down the corner. I called Steven Sirota and I says, well, I got in and I, I saw the place, like, how do I buy this now? And he said, I'll be right there. Meet me in front of the building. I don't believe you got in. You and go. I got in, I, he, he met me then. He, he then explained to me the process. He goes, well, what's your offer? At the time they were offering, they were asking $115,000. And at that moment, I see my girlfriend coming out of her mother's house. And the number on the top of her house is 72. That was the address. So oh I gave him an offer of 72,000. And he said, he presented, he called me back the next day. He said, they took it. Oh my so God. I still own that building today. The building is worth about 2.5 million. I've literally gotten offers for 2.5 million with no for sale sign on it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an incredible, incredible story. I mean, I love that. I love that. You know, you have that small town feel you bought in your own town where you knew people and didn't actually realize that you knew the renter. So that's cool. That's a great story. And I love the appreciation on that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the point is, you know, I didn't know what I, anything that I was, I didn't know anything about comps. I didn't know anything about mortgages. I didn't know anything. He, he walked me through it. Uh, the bank itself gave me the mortgage, although they, they hit me over the head because I was self-employed. It was cash business. So back then we used to call it no income, no income verification loans. Okay. Now they're called DSCR loans and it was 17.9% interest with six points. Oh my Lord. Yes. 
Okay, well, that was the 80s. And I think that's what people need to remember is back in the 80s, because my sister's first house, her loan was 18%. And mm-hmm. my kids are complaining now about, you know, seven, eight percent. And she's like, you have no idea. Yeah, it's like, it's a gift now. <laughs> you can make anything work if you want to, right? Right. And again, it worked. But, you know, I got cocky and I thought it was that easy. Oh. And I bought my second building in 1990. And it almost put me in bankruptcy. Okay. Because I did everything the way I was supposed to do it. From everything, from the mortgage broker to negotiating the deal to the contractors I chose. I mean, everything soup to nuts I messed up. But I'm so glad I was I stuck to the hard road and stayed the course because although I was miserable for five years, that property is literally my flagship property today. Okay. And it's worth about 6.5 million. It generates a whole lot of cash. Wow. Uh, And I have no mortgage on it. So I always say real estate's forgiving for those that are willing to stay the course. Right. Yeah. Because I made a lot of mistakes with that. Actually, every single thing I was not supposed to do, I did with that property. Okay. So you, like me, you jumped right in, kind of had to learn as you go. Or you kind of were learning as you went along, right? As you as you made mistakes, you learned from them, and that's how you kind of grew. Not exactly the most enjoyable way to start a business, but nonetheless, I think it's the way that most people start, at least when it comes to owning rental properties, I should say. So because many of our listeners are just starting out or have not yet invested, but are trying to soak up as much free knowledge as they can before they jump in. Tell us about some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you were first starting out. Challenges, the biggest challenge I faced when I first started are challenges that people don't have to face today in the sense of information, right? When I started in 1989, I started my self-employment life in 1985. But when I also went into the real estate sector of the business, it was the same exact situation. There was a whole lack of knowledge. Usually the guys in this business, which, you know, usually old guys that kept all the information close to their chest, wouldn't give out any information, wouldn't share any of their, their, their resources or their vendors. So I was fortunate in the sense that there were two particular individuals that took a liking to me and, and, and did give me some information to this day, pay them a lot of respect and give them a lot of credit for my, for part of my success because of the information they provided me. Right. But. We didn't have networking events. We didn't have social media, YouTube or podcasts or Instagram or Facebook. And it is so easy today. It's virtually almost impossible to fail in today's right. environment with the information that we have available to us. Right. If you fail, my opinion is if you fail, it's because you are not using all of the information that is available to you today. I mean, we talk about, I mean, you do in-person things. And I first started out, the only way that I learned was by going to uh, rental housing association meetings and I'd drive an hour and a half to get to them. They'd be at a seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, I'm leaving out of here at five, five thirty with three little kids, mind you. So luckily my husband was able to handle all that. And you do what you got to do to kind of learn how to do things and to meet people. And I mean, that's how we found our painter. And that's how I found, you know, a lot of our team, I should say at that time, that's how we found them. Now we've transitioned and changed things a little bit, but yeah, no, it's, um, it's it's networking events. I mean, look, I do a free mentorship class every Wednesday. It amazes me that I only get like 80 to hundred people. I mean, it amazes. I, I, if, if it were me back then, I'd stop whatever I was doing at that specific time to be there that moment. right? Right. But we didn't have this available to us. If I wanted information, I would subscribe to the New York Times and the Journal and hope to God that they were really good, interesting articles in the real estate section on Sundays. Right. That was it, pretty much. There was some magazines, but they were really geared towards the big boys, right? The guys that are building the skyscrapers. and Multi- the, Big multifamily, yeah. They weren't geared towards people like us, right? Or that is just no. starting off and looking to, to gather information. How do I do this? Right. Today, I find that people fail because they say they want to be real estate investors. And then when they realize 
how much you should learn and know so that you could stay competitive in this market, they start with dwindling off, right? Because it takes work. It takes work. And that's the thing too, is that the biggest thing that we try to tell people is everyone online is saying, this is passive. It's passive. No, it is not passive. You know, if you want to grow and you want to succeed at this, there is no way you can say that this is a passive job. No, people tell me I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to give it to a a property manager. All right. How are you going to pick your property manager? How are you going to know if your property manager is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing if you've never done it? I'm not telling you not to give your stuff to a property manager, but learn how to do it first so that you know what you can manage your property manager too. So that is exactly, exactly what Kevin and I, we did a episode all about how to find a property manager and the questions that you should use to ask and to vet them, right? Because just because Joe down the street knows how to property manage doesn't mean that's going to be your guy. Everybody has different levels as to what's important to them. So you need to make sure that your property manager is going to be taking care of what is important to you. So, but hey, we have no, we're property managers ourselves. We have no issues with property managers. But if you're going to pick one, you need to understand what the managing is all about so that you know what you're getting when this guy comes along or girl comes it's, along or whatever. The right person. You're going to appreciate them because you know how difficult it is. If you have a hundred doors, you're managing a hundred personalities. Mm-hmm. And then on top of the personalities, you got to manage all the vendors that got to service those personalities. Yeah. Uh, so it's a trampoline act. It's walking a tightrope sometimes. It is. It is, yeah. but. But it's fun and we love it. So, I mean, I don't know. It's not for everyone, but, you know, it's our thing. So. I agree. I know. Okay. So how, after that first rental, how fast did you scale or how confident were you enough to buy that next property? I know you kind of spoke about it a little bit, but how much time was that in between there? So after I bought my first property, I right away jumped into the second property because I had been saving so much cash. I had been living below my means. I was making a lot of money. I literally lived in an apartment that was $350 at the time rent because it was right in front of the highway. It was a very shady area of the neighborhood. Uh, whereas if I, I could have lived paying back then nicer neighborhoods, the next neighborhood over would have been 1250 But the way I looked at it was, oh, wait a minute, that's $900 a month I could save living here, oh. right? That's $10,800 a year. In two years, I have my next down payment. You know, everything was always like, in my mind, to scale, but work, get my 25, 30% down, and then go buy my next property. Mm-hmm. But after I bought the second property, it beat me up so bad. I was, I, I was numb and I was just trying to get out of the hole. It took about five years, six years. Then I started, I, I learned so much while I was trying to get out of that that miserable hole I dug myself into with that second property. I said to myself, I'm going to use this learning experience, make sure this never happens to me again. So although I may have lost a couple, few hundred thousand dollars back then, which to me today would have been like a couple of million. That's how bad it was. Of course. Yeah. I've made millions of dollars as a result of that experience with that property. Cause I've corrected my, my thought process, my, my process, my procedures. So I started scaling about one every year and a half because my primary area to buy in was Brooklyn, New York. I didn't want to buy anything that wasn't walking distance from my store because of the traffic. I figured, and we didn't have cell phones where I could still do business while I was sitting in the car, right? I was thinking about what's the most effect, efficient way to do this. At the same time, I had also started a laundromat business. I was very busy. I started scaling about one property per every year and a half, but I'll tell you what happened. I got really depressed around 30, 31. You know, thinking back, I might've been clinically depressed because I read uh, a note that I wrote myself in high school when I was 18, where I was going to be when I was 30 and 32, 34, 36. And I was nowhere remotely close to it. Mm -hmm. So after like three months, I started getting angry instead of depressed. And it took me another three months to figure out what my mistake was. And my mistake was I had a goal, but I didn't have a plan. So after I developed my first plan, it took about another six months to really fine tune the plan. And I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody the plan was, okay, 
this is where I want to be in 10 years, but I need to reach this goal within 12 months so I could get here. Then to reach this goal within three years, this goal within five, this goal within seven. But then I had to create like variables, right? Where the plan had to be like a tree that, a palm tree that would swing with the wind. Because if I made it stiff, it would break. And there's variables we can't control. We can't control the economy. We can't control if we get sick or if a loved one gets sick. We can't control divorce. We can't control things that that are beyond our control, for instance, right? And those plans have to readjust, but that doesn't mean that the goal readjusts. The goal stays the same. You just have to recalculate the plan accordingly, right? Right. Uh, And when I was able to figure that out, the whole trajectory changed. I'll sideline here a little bit. So my late husband and I, we owned a uh, a lighting store and it was here in our hometown. And, you know, he, he'd been sick, but, you know, he was still able to manage everything and, and take care of everything. And we were struggling and our CPA had recommended that we take this goal setting course because he said, you know where you want to be, but you have no idea on how to get there. And I think at the time it was like, 2000 or 5000 it might have even been $10,000 i don't know all i know is it was for me it was a lot of money to put out and we got this huge binder and it had all this information in it we went to the meetings it was you had to go and sit and it was like in a conference room and you sat and you had to talk about what your goals were and you had to talk about how you're reaching them and what changes you were making and not only for that business. But I mean, it, it has helped me in life and it has helped me in this business. And, yes. and it just, it really just changes your perspective. So I think that, you know, for, for everybody out there who's kind of listening right now, and there's a lot of books on this, you don't have to go and spend thousands of dollars like I did, but, you know, setting your goals and being adaptable to the changes for those goals, just like you said, I mean, at the time, you know, my husband was sick, so we had to kind of ch- switch some things up when he wasn't feeling well and stuff. So it's again, those are the variables you can't control, but you can't control how you adapt, how you adjust, you pivot. And one thing I've got to say, I'm sure you're going to agree with me when you're setting your plan to reach your goals, you got to do some deep, deep soul searching, right? And then and be really honest with you yourself. And then that's when you say, that's not realistic, right? But am I wrong? Doesn't it take a lot of deep soul searching? Absolutely. I mean, 100%. I mean, you really find out who you are as a person when you're going through even just figuring out if buying rental properties is what you want to do. So, I mean, you have to make sure that you, if you have a spouse or a partner, you have to make sure that they're on board because there's a lot of money, there's a lot of time, and your, you know, personality can be kind of waning sometimes. You're not always in the best mood when it's been a kind of a crappy day. You know, it's, it's, if you don't mind, I want to take that a step further when you, you just said your spouse, right? So people ask me all the time, why did I date my wife for eight years before I proposed? And I was like, I needed to make sure she understood being married to me was difficult because, <laughs> you know, I, in general, spouses that are married, that choose to marry entrepreneurs, my hat goes off to them. I don't think they get enough credit. A hundred percent. Because they have to really be self-dependent. Like, you know, I have four kids. My wife was home with them and I was barely home. People ask my wife, well, how are you married 36 years? He says, well, the first 20 years, Danny was never home. Mm-hmm. You know, he was always out working. So yeah. that takes, you both have to be like two horses pulling the wagon together. Cause if one horse goes to the right and the other goes to the left, you're done. Wagon's not going anywhere. Right. I tell people before you start going down that road of entrepreneurship, whatever that is, make sure that you and your spouse or that significant other are on the same page because it's, it's stressful. It's financially stressful. Sometimes you may have a lot of money, but you can't spend it because on taking a vacation or getting something you may want, because it's got to be reinvested into the business. So yeah. even though you may have large balances sometimes in your account that you have to look at it as if you don't have it, because if you don't feed your business first, your business will never be able to feed you. No. And you can't be wanting to always have the newest and the best of everything, right? Like you mentioned your car. I mean, Kevin and I just spent, you know, a few thousand dollars putting it into our truck that's 14 years old. There's nothing wrong with it. It Just had an oil leak. But, you know, in order to get the work done and 
yeah, it doesn't have all the, you know, high tech stuff now. It doesn't have the big screen in it and the whatever car play and all that kind of stuff. But it works for us. Right? We're loading crap in there that I wouldn't want to be putting in a brand new vehicle. So and it works. We got yeah. a dog and it's like hey, I don't want to put the money out. We got the money. We can go out and buy a beautiful car right now, cash. But that's not what we choose to do. We are in growth mode right now. We okay. want to take that cash. We're being smart about it. And we want to invest it, whether it's in property or stocks or whatever. We kind of sat down and said, all right, we're enjoying the life we have. We want to continue to enjoy this for the next 40, 50 years at this level. Well, how are we going to do that? Right? So just like you said, we kind of have a plan. And, and buying new vehicles right now is not in our plan. No, it, you know, it's a depreciating asset. I listen, I just bought myself a new truck last year. It's the most money I've ever spent on a vehicle. It oh, kills you, doesn't it? You're like, ah. I've always wanted a truck that nice. And I turned 60 last year and it was my wife and my kids are like, you know, like that. Are you ever going to get yourself what you really want? And mm -hmm. I did it. And I'm not going to tell you, I did it begrudgingly when I, when I was signing that con that, that and bringing them the check, but. I'm so glad I did, but it took, I, I want everyone here to realize something didn't happen overnight. When people tell me, you know, you're so lucky or it's nice to be you. And I'd say, yeah, it is. It's, I was a 35 year overnight success. You're so right. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of grew up a little differently. So I, my dad was like number four in command in a very large corporation and did very well. Our family did well, but I will tell you, he took the time to teach all of us kids, how to manage your money, how to invest, what to do, what you're looking for in your investments and what your minimums should be and all that kind of stuff. And since then, things have changed. I also learned from him about about my vehicles, too. Right. I mean, my parents, bless their heart, they're still both alive. Their newest car is like a 2004. Yeah. <laughs> and, they have, and, you know, yeah, they got the money. Go Let's buy whatever they want. But read the book, whatever. It's a mil millionaire mind and the millionaire next door. You know, most, the majority of millionaires in the, in the United States are not car people. They buy a car and they keep them on average about 10 to 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's fine too. And ha my hat off to you if you want to go out and buy expensive cars. I mean, that, that's fine. If you got the money to do it and that's your thing, so be it. I mean, that yeah. Yeah, everyone could do whatever they want. Right. So. All right, so we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. We're gonna talk about risk. So when you're an entrepreneur, regardless of if it's owning rental property or a restaurant or a retail store or even a service business, there's always risk that business owners have to mitigate. And I would guess that you would agree that owning rental properties certainly include a lot of risk. So you've talked before, you've done videos on tenant screening and maintenance and We've talked about how to legally hold your properties and insurance policies, all that stuff. So can you share any risks that you have encountered and how you have mitigated those? Like you have any juicy stories or anything like that? Especially as real estate investors, we're constantly risking, right? So I had a friend of mine, John, he's asked me several times to go to Atlantic City and he, he gets all these rooms comps because he handles so much. And he says, well, why don't you, you know, I invite you and your wife all the time. I get you a room comp and I see. You know, we could play some cards and we could gamble. And I'm like, John, I gamble every day, man. Right. This is what I, for a living, I gamble. The difference is that the odds are on my side. Yeah. Right? Because I mitigate my risk. So I'll tell you when I started, when I first started, I didn't buy anything under LLC or S Corps. Because when I did, when I started to do that, I realized, actually, I bought one property under an S Corp. And I realized my title and, and the closings were about 15 to 20% more. Okay. My loan was about three quarters of a point higher because I had yep. it on the company name. And I was still required to personally guarantee it. So it was still showing up on my credit report, even though the property was under my escort. So the next one I did, I said, you know what? I'm going to put it under my name. And it was one of my attorneys that said to me, you're really putting yourself at risk. You put everything under your name. I, and I explained to him the reason why. And I, I, I says, it'll slow down the way I could scale if I have to pay all this extra money. It was through his suggestion that I then looked into it, 
which was an umbrella policy because I had owned my own home. Yep. So I went to my broker, my insurance broker, his name was Carlson Carl Town at the time. And I said, what is this thing, an umbrella policy? Can you explain it to me? And he explained it to me. And I took a multi-million dollar insurance policy using my house to get that umbrella policy. And every time I added a property to it, it would cost me like back then another hundred to $187 to $240, depending on the property size. Yeah. Umbrella which, policies are very reasonable. Yes, extremely. So when I got to 10 properties, that's when the umbrella policy said, okay, we're not insuring anymore. You've reached your limit. But by then I was, I could sustain those extra costs because I had the cash flow and I had built up my business. So okay. that's, you know, did I ever get sued when I owned those 10 properties under my personal name? I did not. But if I had gotten sued, I had a million dollar coverage liability wise on the property itself. And then I had a multi-million dollar coverage through my umbrella policy that was very inexpensive and it was a write-off. So that's how I try to mitigate that situation. But again, that I didn't know that I, I was, you know, you, you surround yourself with the right people for advice and then they give you information and then you go and investigate that information with the individuals that specialize in that particular field. And then you make a decision. And that's one of the ways how I mitigated my risk, but yet keep my, keep my costs low. No, that's so, and that's how we start out too. I mean, we're getting ready to buy another property. I'll buy it in my name. And I think that's one of the things that people need to understand is that when you want to put something into an LLC, you have to make sure your lender is going to be on board for that because some will let you and some absolutely will not allow you to transfer a loan into the name because you're changing title, right? It's no longer in Stacey Casella or Dan Barrero. It's now going to be in XYZ LLC. And that changes the whole title. It changes who the banks can go after to get the money, the whole nine. So it's a knowledge thing. You have to be careful. And that's where your broker, your you know mortgage broker, is has to be knowledgeable about which lenders allow you to do that and which don't. Yeah. So I did start doing that later because I didn't know I could do that either. Probably not until like I was in the business for 15 years. But again, I did start to take that strategy as well later on. Right. Yeah. You All don't right. want the long clause to come back at you and, and them calling you the loan. And they call on the loan. Yeah. And then you end up having to sell it or sell it at a discount just so you can or, or work in it on. It. I mean, look, you know, it all depends what state you're in, right? So if that was to happen to me in New York, I'd sit down at the bank and say, you can start foreclosure on me or you could just give me five months and I'll refinance it and pay you out. Or I could transfer, I'll transfer it back to its original title. But if you start to foreclose on I me, mean, you, 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 I'll, I'll tie you up for the next five years, right? So right. based on who that asset manager is, that personality, you can negotiate something. That's New York State, right? Everything's very litigation. Um, whereas if you go down south or the Midwest, it's not as such as litigate. The, the litigation process is much shorter. You won't be able to address it in that same way. So everything depends on where you're investing and the personalities that are involved. Yeah. California is quite litigious as well. So, you know, we're in the same boat and I think it's the coastal areas, but it's definitely something that, when again, we did do a, a podcast on that too. Is it right for you to put your property into an LLC? So if you guys want to go back and listen to that, you can listen to that too. But this is all the risk. This is all the things you kind of have to know. And again, it's not a passive jobs or in, so anyway, so let me do something real quick. Let's change things a little bit. Talk to me about what goes in a day in the life of Dan Barrero. Ooh, that's a good question. There is no day that's the same. The only thing I can say is Mondays are usually the days that I'm turning out fires. Okay. And I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So everybody that's supposed to have gotten back to you on Friday now wants their answers or needs those documents on Monday because they work nine to five. You work literally from six to 10 at night. Yeah. That's what entrepreneurs do. Right. And because they chose to leave on Friday, you know, at four o'clock, they think that everybody has that same mentality. Right. And I'm, I'm not putting anybody down who works nine to five, but that's just the reality, especially when it comes to the banks and when it comes to title companies, commercial brokers, commercial real estate brokers are a different animal come, you know, three o'clock Friday, they stop answering phone calls. 
but then on Monday morning at eight o'clock, they expect you to pick up and hey, Dan Barrero is going to get me this right now. No, it doesn't yeah. work that way. So it all depends on what day. Mondays are my worst days. Friday afternoons, all day Friday is also a bad day because I'm trying to get everything done so that I'm not getting hit so hard on Monday. Saturdays and Sundays are literally my catch up day. I'm going to sit at my desk and it's peaceful because the phones aren't ringing. Yeah. So I can actually get real work done. But during the week, it all depends on what turnovers I have going on, what renovation jobs I have going on, what properties I'm thinking of buying and doing the research on it, speaking to my attorney, speaking to my mortgage broker, looking at additional information. Where do I find this information? Driving by the property, you know, really early in the morning, then going back in the afternoon, then going back at night to see what kind of people are coming in out of the property. What kind of cars they're driving? When the kids are going to school, are they well-behaved or are they just running amok, right? Um, these are the things we're looking for, right? Uh, especially if we're going into a new neighborhood. I want to be at the bus stop because if you're at the bus stop in the morning, that tells you everything about the personality of the neighborhood. These are the little things, right? If I'm in a new area and I need a new painter, I'm going to go to the painting supply, supply house in that area and sit out there at six in the morning and I'm going to be watching these painters coming in and out and i'm going to determine which one i'm going to go up and walk up to to get an estimate based on how clean their trucks are how they're talking to the men if their men are dressed properly you know if they're cursing i don't want them right they're pulling up with the, with the music blasting i don't want them so you know same thing with electricians and plumbers and so it all depends on what i need to get done i could tell you one thing i have a very very sophisticated to do list that I put together and it's real sophisticated guys. And this is it right here. <laughs> you You're know. showing a piece of paper with just a bunch of uh, a whole line with the ball crossed out. Oh my gosh. You are um, just yeah. like me. I love to make a list and cross it out. It makes me feel like I'm really succeeding when I'm getting down to about 75% of that list crossed out. <laughs> you know, but the, the truth is if I don't have this that I do for myself every night for the uh -huh. following day, I get lost in the weeds with the phone calls. This keeps me on track. All right. I just took care of that problem. That was unexpected. I resolved that issue on the phone or, or I sent somebody over to take care of it. But now I got to get back to my list because this has to get done. If this doesn't get done, everyone else's jobs can, can't get done because we need to give them direction, right? Yeah, that's the day in my life. It uh, depends what time of the day you call me. Sometimes I'm negotiating a contract with a vendor. Sometimes... I'm negotiating a, a deal with, to buy a property or sell a property. Sometimes I'm actually really pissed off and just fired somebody and start doing the painting myself or clean those hallways myself. Actually, right after this, I, I'll be getting changed and I'll be putting on my work boots and my work clothes. And I'm going to be going on to two job sites unannounced, as I usually do, because I don't want them to know I'm coming and when I'm coming. And I'm going to go check up on the job sites, right? So yeah. it all depends on what time of the day you call me is what, you know, what hat I have on. So for perspective, you have about around a hundred units, a little more, right? You said that you manage them all yourself or do you have, how many are we, in your team? I am, I'm, well, it depends. There's different teams. So we have a team for New Jersey. We have a team for Florida and then we have a team from New York. Okay. But my brother and I, we manage all three teams. There's a lot of process and procedures that goes involved with that. And I want everybody to understand you can't do this business without having the right team. And you have to understand that that team sometimes could take, it could take upwards of a year. You're lucky if you could assemble a really good team in less than a year, but it, it averages to us about a year. And even after we have a good team, those team members change. A lot of those team members change, right? Because. Just think of like any professional baseball team, football team, basketball team, that they, they may win the championships and players will be changed the following year, even though they won a championship, right? With those players, a lot of personality conflicts come into effect. Sometimes like a contract, we, you know, the average good contract that lasts about five to seven years of part of the team. After that, either they get too comfortable, their prices start going up, or they think they could do it. They think they, you make it look so easy. They think they could do what you do. Sometimes they get sick. Sometimes they decide to move. Uh, one of my contractors was going through a divorce. He just lost his head. And just like, no matter how much I try to work with him, it really affected him. And he didn't want to work anymore. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, listen, this ain't working anymore. I've given you a year and it, it, you could keep screwing me up. So the team members will change. 
but you can't do this business without having a really good team. Uh, effectively, you can't. Yeah, and, and no, most I... important, you need to give your team members the resources they need to make the job happen. You can't expect someone to do their job, but yet not have trained them properly or provided them the resources to do it right. 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 No, all all very good point. Very good point. And we've spoken a n- number of times about we have one guy here in Sacramento that will help us out. And his name is Jim and he's a licensed contractor. I think he's in his 60s. We'll just say I think he's in his 60s. So he doesn't really want to do the heavy listing stuff. When we have really big remodels and things like that. He'll help us to manage those things. But he is perfect for, hey, Jim, we got to go out and fix a doorknob or we have to fix a toilet or whatever. He can handle some of that stuff, but and he can manage bigger guys, too. So he's actually been a perfect fit for us. So he came with all his, he came with his roofer, he came with his electrician, he came with all that, right? You're, so, already, you're using him where he best fits, right? So I see a lot of people get upset with a contract. This guy does everything, but he won't do le- electrical. He does everything and he does a really bad job with my painting. I says, well, then don't let him do the painting. Yeah. Does he show up on time? Yeah. Does he, is he there when he says he's going to be there? Yeah. Is he killing you with the price? No. I said, well, then give him what he does best. Yeah. Well, you don't take an English teacher, make him into a math teacher. You don't right. take a plumber and ask him to do electrical work. Right? right. You know, put them where they best fit. No, that's great. So we're kind of getting down on time here. I wanted to talk to you about a property in New York that you recently sold, not because it wasn't doing well, but because the state of New York has made it really difficult to own rental properties, uh, at least for, you know, the smaller landlords, I should say. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, so you sold it. Did you do a 1031 exchange? Did you sell it outright? And kind of why did you sell that? Yeah, it's, I didn't know you were going to ask you that, but that's a real sore subject for me. Okay. Well, we can skip it if you want. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, that's a really good question because this is this is a really good topic, actually. You know, when on social media, you're going to see a lot of people, well, you can sell the property, you put it into a 1031, and you never have to pay the taxes. Well, you know, it's true to an extent. I have sold properties. We do put it into 1031s. There are properties I'm never going to sell, and I'm going to put them into a trust as I get older. My kids will get the step-up values. They'll never pay the taxes, right? right. Mm-hmm. Uh, all legal. All right. Now, guys, I'm not, I'm not on here to give any legal advice or state advice. I'm not an attorney or an accountant that you should get from those specific professionals. But in this particular case, I did have partners. I didn't have any problems with those partners, but this particular property happened to be my lowest performing property. It was a two family building with two, with a storefront and had difficulty with getting the right tenants in there the last eight years. And then every time I do get the right tenant, the last two tenants, literally the jobs moved them so much so that the jobs even paid me to buy out their lease. Oh, wow. Uh, And they were great tenants. So I can't, but it was just, you know, again, it was the lowest performing property. And every time I turn around, the city of New York is hitting me with another rule, another regulation, and somehow or another getting their hands into my pocket. And when I looked at all the time that I spent on that property with the appreciation, and then I was able to get rid of my partners, not to say that I had a problem with them because I didn't, but it's been time. You know, I owned the building since 1990. We made a lot of money. And although I am paying the taxes on it, I'm now able to use my share of that money to buy another property just for myself and my wife, of course, where it's now the next down payment. And Case in point, you and I were speaking about a specific property this morning before we went live, where within two years, or rather less than two years, within 12 to 18 months, that property would be worth doubles and the cash flow would be at about a 16% cap. So although I'm paying these ridiculous taxes to the city of New York and the state and the federal government, I'm going to be on my own with that, with those funds, and I'm going to recapture those, that, those taxes with the asset appreciation and with the cash flow, which now will get into a, put into a trust eventually. And then my kids will get the step up value on it when I drop that, if they choose to sell it and we'll never pay taxes again. So sometimes you got to bite the bullet, but what kills me is that's literally on the same block as other, my other properties, a, a few of my other properties. And I know for a fact, every time I, I drive down there, 
park my car and have to walk by this property. I'm like, this should still be mine. Yeah. Um, Cause I never thought as I was buying property in New York city that I would ever sell them. Right. So this is the first property I've sold that has a fixture. I've bought a lot of lots in the in Brooklyn, in New York city, and then resold them like five, seven, eight years later to developers and make a ton of money on it. But I've never, but that was the goal. I took that money and those profits and I actually did 1031s because back then you could then go from a lot to a building. Okay. And that's one of the ways how I scaled my property in the city of New York, right? Because land is easy to manage. There's nothing to do. Matter of fact, this property here, I had did with a 1031 from a lot that I sold up the corner. I bought that lot for $235,000 and, you know, about five years later or six years later, I sold it for 1.6 million. I took some of that money as a 1031 and bought this particular property that I just sold for 145. And then I put another hundred thousand in renovations. I bought one around the corner for like 260. That was worth about $3 million now. Yeah. Also with that lot sale. Right. So again, what I'm saying is I never thought I'd be wanting to sell, but the, you know, the catalyst is that the city of New York, they just keep imposing so many new rules and laws and they make it so difficult right now in Kings County, which is Brooklyn, the average time that it would take for a judge to give you to agree to sign the warrant for an eviction is 26 months. Whoa. 26 months. And then oh. it, the judge takes another eight weeks to sign the warrant. And then the marshal says, Hey, I'm so backed up with trying to, with the evictions, I can't get to you for another four weeks. Okay. So you're no longer 26 months. You're at like 31 months, you know, between 30 and 31 months. Holy cow. Wow. I thought California was bad. <laughs> so when people ask me, you know, why I want to sell, I don't want to sell it in New York. Don't right. because people are buying, I'm not going to kid you that this person, the price he bought that at. It's a negative 3% cap. So I said, yes, I'll sell it. But I was asking a ridiculous number. I would never pay that month that, for that. Right. Property. Although right. the property was an immaculate board. And he says, listen, I didn't got no, out of nothing to do here. Right. Um, well, yeah. he's just, he's banking on appreciation. I mean, that's, Correct. that's straight up. So, yeah. and that, you know, there's different methods to it. And I, again, I, I wouldn't buy anything and that's. That's one of the problems we're having here in California, right? We're getting ready to buy our next property. We'd love to buy in California. One, the laws are a little tough. They're they're definitely pro-tenant. And a lot of the landlords haven't managed their properties right. Now they're trying to sell them at for top top price and their rents are severely below market. Well, we have rent control and I can't go in and just raise the rent. So why would I go in and be underwater for 700, 800 bucks a month banking on appreciation? I'm not in a position to where I want to do that. Not right now. Look, the reality, that's one of the other reason why I, I, I'm selling here is it looks like this may even go through that they want to impose no more than a 3% cap of an increase yeah. mm -hmm. of rent, which means every apartment in the, in the state of New York or the city of New York will become rent stabilized. And I'm like, hold on a second. And then they want to impose what they call a good guy clause. And not to go too long into it. Essentially what they want to do is cap everything I could do to my tenants, but they want to raise my water and sewer charges eight, 9%, which they are actually come July 1st. They want to raise my taxes a ridiculous amount. They give the insurance companies the permission to raise my, my insurance 42% over the last 24 months. They give the utility companies permission to raise the utilities eight, nine, 10% a year. Right. But they want to tell me, but I got to cap my raises at 3%. Well, hold on a second. And I don't have a problem doing that. Then cap everybody else's expenses. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, the reality is this, there's a lot of governments out here, local governments blaming landlords. But the reality is, though, we have to raise our rents just to keep up with the impositions that they put upon us with tax implications. Yeah. So that's, and it's unfortunate, but that's not getting across out to the right voting public. Right. Nope. Yeah. It, it's definitely a, a tough situation. So we are almost done here and I like to kind of do some little quick fire questions so you can, you know, do some real quick answers here. Are you ready? I'm a little scared right now, but yes. Let's <laughs> 
tell our listeners a couple ways that you keep up with changes in the rental property and self-management area. So like, what's helpful to you? Do you like reading books? Do you listen to podcasts? Are you watching YouTubers? I, I, I will listen to podcasts. Not very often. YouTube is preferable, but believe it or not, I like, I don't do my own rentals. I, I refuse to do that. I won't do that anymore. I have my realtors do that. And depending on the area, so New York City, the tenant has to pay the real estate fee. But in North Jersey, the tenant also pays the real estate fee. But if you go to South Jersey, the landlord pays for it. If you go to Central Florida, the landlord pays for it. And I don't care if I have to pay for it because that realtor keeps me honest, right? Because that realtor has to go for continuous ed classes every year. Correct. And that realtor's coming back telling me what I could do and not do, right? Or what I could ask for or not ask. What questions I could ask and what questions I can't ask as those laws change. So they keep me honest and they keep me educated. That's one of the ways. Another thing is what I do, I actually always subscribe to whatever area I'm in, to the housing department website. I also subscribe to all the political, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, it's irrelevant to me. I always subscribe and get put on their newsletter, on their email list. So any changes that are happening in the area, whatever that may be pertaining to my business, I'm going to see it immediately. These are the things that I normally do to stay up with it. Very smart. Very smart. I, I like that last one there. I, you know, we kind of are a little dependent on our, our association for that information. So, I mean, there are associations you could join. I do that as well, but I find that the best, the most qualified information I get is my realtors. They really keep me honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're realtors, so that's what we're paid to do. Right. What I said, right. Cause you got to go for continuous ed classes every year. Yep. We do. So, all right. What advice do you have for aspiring or newbie landlords? Like what is one mistake that you see new landlords making and how can they avoid it? The biggest mistake I find a lot of new investors making is getting advice from all the wrong people. You shouldn't be taking advice from your brother, your sister, your mother, your aunt, your friend, your cousin. You don't go to a Chevy mechanic if you have a port. You don't go to your dentist if you need heart surgery right? Get your advice from the very same people that are actually doing this. That's the biggest mistake I find that people make. Yeah. Plus, plus follow the wrong people on social media. There's a lot of people out there who are selling courses rather than actually doing this for a living. So if you're going to follow somebody, follow somebody that's actually doing it and making money from doing what they say they could teach you to do. Right. Agreed. Agreed. All right. If you could go back to 1989 and give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Not everybody's your friend. Your family may have the best interests at heart, but you're not going to always get the best advice. And always trust, but verify. I like that one. All right. So you do in-person seminars. You want to tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, we do a free mentorship class every single Wednesday night. I'm really proud of that. We just, we just hit 100 free mentorship classes. We've been doing it for two years now. A little over wow. two years. And what's exciting is that so many of my mentees are actually achieving success where they're like sending me pictures at the closing table or in front of their first and second and third properties. Sometimes they use my vendors. Sometimes they don't. It doesn't matter to me. But the point is, you know, they're all now networking among each other and they're becoming partners. And it's just, it's just fascinating. And it, it's my new currency watching them grow. That's awesome. And those are in person? Yeah, we do that via Zoom every Wednesday night. Summer months, I cut that down to once a month because okay. I too want to enjoy my summer. Because we put a lot of work into preparing the lesson plan. We actually send out a, a worksheet so that a mentees could use that as, as a guideline and writing their notes. I hope that they save it so that if they come across that problem with a contractor or a tenant or, or whatever that is with the tax man or or whatever that is, they could go back to those notes. And we just launched our video library where all of our mentorship classes are now on a library. So that let's say you missed this Wednesday, right? It'll be up within 48 hours. You can watch it at your convenience or listen to it at your convenience. I'm really proud of the mentorship class that we started and I'm most proud of the success of the students. Oh, and, and the other thing I'm really proud of is that we're doing this absolute, we, we're still managing to do it for free. Yeah. See, I mean, that, that is the epitome of giving back to the community, yes. right? Yeah. And, and that's amazing. 
No, yeah. hat, my hat off to you. That's awesome. Yeah. And I got to say, I could do that because my, my kids are all adults now. There was young, but I couldn't do that because we don't sock the games, basketball games, baseball games. But now that my kids are older and, you know, it's just my wife and I, I have the time to do that. So I'm enjoying it. Yes. There you go. All right. So in terms of owning rentals and self-managing your properties, what does the future hold for you, Dan? So we are, we, we are going more into the commercial side now, primarily because the residential side, I'm not going to kid you. It's a younger man's game in my opinion. I've made a lot of money. I don't need it. I'm still in the business because I love the business that I'm in. Um, can I retire today? Yes. I, can I see myself retired? No, we, we're just restructuring slightly. And, and moving things around so that I could manage less, but still have the cash flow. Awesome. All right. Tell everyone how they can get in hold of you. Uh, go to Daniel Barrero Jr. Dot com and all of my stuff is there. You go to USA Land Ventures on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and you could find me there. Or just type in my name, Daniel Barrero Jr. Awesome. Okay. Well, this interview has been such a pleasure. And I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of it. I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us today. I appreciate you inviting me. And like I said to you earlier, I love your content. You are, you guys are probably the most detailed people out there that I've seen. Your writing is unbelievable. I mean, anybody is listening to this and not following you, they're nuts. Um, oh, I appreciate that. Your information is so spot on. It's, it's crazy. That's awesome. Uh, we'll go ahead also in our show notes, you guys, everything will be, every way to get a hold of Dan will be linked in the show notes. So in case you didn't catch it. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Not a problem. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Wow. Just wow. Dan is such an impressive person to listen to. And I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation as much as I did interviewing him. I really have the most deepest respect for him and appreciate how real he is, especially when it comes to discussing rental properties and just life in general. All right, you guys, that is our show for today. We cannot express enough how much we appreciate that you have taken the time out of your day to listen to this interview with Dan Barrero. Again, we will link all the ways to contact him and the couple of podcast episodes we mentioned in the show notes for you to check them out. Let me close out the show with a few things. You want to text us a question? You can find a link at the top of our episode or in the show notes that are attached to each podcast. You guys, this is not a text subscription where we try to contact you with offers. It is very simply like texting a friend or in our case, a mentor who can answer a question for you. If you prefer to email us questions, you can do that too. We'll link our emails in the show notes for you. If you have not checked them out, our show notes also include links to everything we offer. So take a look to see if there's anything there that you can use. We have a lot of checklists to keep you organized and on track. Sample emails that you can cut and paste and use them to send out to your tenants for renewals and how to stay cool during hot weather, things like that. We have our pre-screening questions, the landlord questionnaire for when you're vetting a prospective tenant, you know, things like that. Most all of our forms are free. We only charge for two items, which is the inspection checklist, and that's six pages, and the property management questionnaire that has over 60 questions that you can pick from when interviewing a prospective property manager. Good stuff in both those. You can also sign up to get on our wait list for our upcoming course, all about the steps to take to place your ideal tenant and potentially be part of our first beta group. And of course, we have links on there to sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You also find the link to our private Facebook group, our YouTube channel, and of course, the links to our social media sites so you can follow along. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. We hope you enjoyed this interview and got a little something out of it. And until next time, you've got this, landlords. Landlords.